everyone, welcome back to our lecture series on climate change. And what I've been doing is uh, going through some of the major recent writings on the issue of climate change. Uh, we looked at, in previous lectures, uh, Fossil Capital by Andreas Malm, and This uh, Changes Everything by Naomi Klein. <clears throat> and today, I'm going to talk about a uh, work by Michael Mann and Tom Tolles uh, called The Madhouse Effect. And what I do is I just offer a summary and a little bit of uh, analysis of the contents of the work. Um, all of these books that, that uh, I look at in this lecture series are important works dealing with climate change, and they really get to uh, uh, the heart of the issue from multiple different perspectives, I think, which is nice um, <clears throat> to, to kind of uh, uh, that's the benefit of reading many different works as you get these different perspectives. And today, as we'll see in uh, Michael Mann's work, uh, he is a climate scientist, and one of the strong points of the work is that he very clearly uh, articulates what the, the problem is and the issue of climate change in uh, a language that is very easy to understand and uh, often quite fun to read. So... Uh, let's get started. And the work is Michael Mann and Tom Toll's uh, The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. Just some quick background. First, Michael Mann is a prominent climatologist and geophysicist at Penn State. He's famous for developing the hockey stick graph, which shows that global temperatures over a period, it uh, shows global temperatures over a period of 1,000 years, uh, and then it shows temperature rise at the latter part of the graph uh, from the Industrial Revolution and demonstrates how this is attributable to uh, human CO2 emissions. And Tom Tolles is a, an American cartoonist who uh, writes for the Washington Post and uh, other publications. So, I'll just go through each of the chapters, give a summary and a little bit of analysis, but save the main analysis for uh, the end of my talk. So in the preface of uh, The Madhouse Effect, the authors lay out their basic argument, which is that uh, the science of human-induced climate change has been hijacked by, quote, a campaign of deliberate misinformation and pseudoscience that has, quote, skewed public discourse. They note that climate change is a matter of politics over science, very importantly, and they aim to clarify the science to debunk the deniers and reveal the political manipulation of science. In chapter one, um, the authors go over the issue uh, broadly, and they begin by talking about what science is and basically, they say it's a self-correcting process. It's not always right, but it has mechanisms in place to correct itself so that it can eventually arrive at knowledge, basically, knowledge production. Um, skepticism is an important part of science, and science often challenge each other's findings. But, quote, deliberate confusion can also be sown under a false pretext of skepticism especially by those with political aims who aren't interested in establishing the truth, but rather just sowing seeds of doubt. And so this is an important part of uh, the Madhouse Effect, is that it talks about you know, how deniers use skepticism, basically, um, even though they themselves are not scientists and don't really have a grasp of the issues. The science of climate change is clear say the authors, but thanks to a war on science by powerful vested interests, mainly the fossil fuel industry, we now, we now live in a, quote, bizarro world where 24-hour right-wing media like Fox News presents alternative facts that so doubt. And importantly, it's not just Fox News, it's actually all mainstream media, as Michael Mann says, because they frame, they tend to cl frame climate change as a two-sides issue. Now, this is maybe gradually starting to change where um, some news organizations or programs are saying, look, we're not going to debate climate change like there's two sides to this. I mean, it's a settled issue. It's science. 
Um, but in general, still, the trend in mainstream media is, you know, to show both sides, um, which in the case of established facts uh, is actually undermining science. Uh, chapter two, climate change, the basics. And here, this is one of the strong points of Michael Mann's work is that as a climate scientist, he just really clearly uh, lays out, you know, what climate change is and obviously shows that it's caused by uh, uh, humans in, in our present situation. So um, first, CO2 is a known heat-trapping gas. I mean, this is an undisputable fact. Uh, and second, humans are emitting CO2 by burning fossil fuels. So there, it's very simple. That's the issue. Um, obviously, the temperature is going to go up. We can measure the parts per million. Uh, we can measure CO2 in the atmosphere by parts per million. Before the Industrial Revolution, it was 280 parts per million. Now there are over 400. Um, and as a result, the Earth has warmed, warmed today uh, from the Industrial Revolution 1.5 degrees Celsius with projections showing 5 degrees Celsius uh, warming by the end of the century. What are the effects of this? Well, uh, some of them would be... Uh, oops. I have to change this a bit here. Yes, I uh, did not fit this all on the same page. Oops. So just go like this. Just put this all on a new slide. Why not? <clears throat> hey, there we go. That's a lot easier to read. All right, and what are some of the effects of this? Well, first, uh, there's gonna be more water in the atmosphere because warmer uh, air holds more water. And due to rising and sinking motions in the atmosphere, this means it will rain actually paradoxically less often, but when it does rain, uh, or snow, hurricane, blizzard, etc there's going to be a lot more rain and it's just going to come in uh, torrents and, and cause flooding, you know, flash flooding and all of this. Uh, ocean levels are going to rise. They've already risen 25.4 centimeters with conservative estimates showing a rise of one meter by the end of the century, or it could even be up to almost two meters by the end of the century. We don't know. There's various predictions, but the conservative estimate is one meter. Air and ocean currents are going to change. The jet stream, Gulf Stream, North Atlantic drift, etc. They're all changing, and this is, means wild weather, uh, uh, just to name some of the few effects. Um, and then extreme weather, that too is one of the effects. Stronger hurricanes, weather events are being made stronger than they would have, heat waves, all of these things that we see in the news all of the time. Uh, and and it just this just seems like it's becoming normal weather now, basically, to have all kinds of you know, off the charts weather. Um, weather forecasters routinely say uh, that this is, you know, record breaking, never seen anything like it in Japanese, kidokuteki. Um, but I mean, they use this all the time now. It's becoming like every day there's a new record broken. So it's almost like the new normal. Um, and then tipping points are going to be crossed. The West Antarctic ice sheet, which we've probably already lost to melting, now means that three meters of sea level are basically locked in, sea level rise. Um, Tom Tolles also does a great job, I want to add, by uh, giving some graphics to this novel, such as this one, very easy to understand, temperature rise and what's going to happen. Uh, Pre-industrial levels, we're here, 25% of all species extinct, approaching this rapidly. New York City submerged at 3 degrees and 50% of all species extinct at 4 degrees. Chapter three, why should I give a damn? Well, uh, if we are already familiar to some extent with the dangers of climate change, then this should be an obvious, uh, there should be an obvious answer to this question. It's going to, as I write here, uh, very colloquially, like, seriously suck for everyone, especially the poor, and we're already feeling the effects now. Um, but Michael Mann goes in to just talk about some of the uh, areas that that climate change is going to affect security, for instance, 
there's going to be more competition for dwindling resources and war. Uh, and he gives the example of Syria and the ongoing drought there and how this likely con contributed to uh, the war there and, and all kinds of climate refugees and fighting over resources. There's going to be a decrease in food production. Um, less grains, massive die-offs in the ocean mean less seafood uh, for humans uh, and, and for fish as well. There's going to be less water. Uh, the world, more of the world is going to be arid or semi-arid. Uh, and then as the globe gets warmer, meltwater from glaciers and ground aquifers are just going to dry up. Uh, there's going to be less land space. And we're already seeing deforestation through mass fires. Uh, areas of the world that are supposed to be cool or temperate at least are suddenly getting very hot and uh, dry. And this is creating more fires. Um, there's going to be massive population shifts, you know, people moving away from the coast, for instance, climate refugees. This is all going to take land. And then um, Michael Mann also kind of highlights a phenomenon of, you know, corporate interests taking more from the earth. And as we've already seen in Naomi Klein's work, uh, she would call this extractivism. Private corporations increasingly destroying more of the earth for personal profit. Uh, oh, and not to mention, of course, and not to forget, of course, uh, many of us will be underwater from rising sea levels, so there's land uh, lost there as well. We're going to suffer from poor health in general. We'll routinely face a uh, threat of heat stroke, diseases, and allergies are already getting worse um, as well. The die-off of ecosystems. We're in the sixth mass extinction. This can't be stressed enough. Um, and then the economy. Well, it's pretty difficult to put a price on the planet, um, obviously, but you know we can try, and Michael Mann does. He gives a figure of a uh, cost of $1.2 trillion to the world economy each year and rising from uh, disasters caused by or exacerbated by climate change. In chapter four, he talks about the stages of denial, he says. And um, to be honest, I think Mainly, a lot of this just applies to the situation in the U.S. I don't know what it's like everywhere, um, but the U.S. really does suffer from uh, a massive disinformation campaign by the right wing and fossil fuel industries, as Michael Mann is showing. So he talks about these stages of denial, you know, cherry-picking data, just rejecting it outright. Um, number four, claiming that it'll be good for us. And then number five is important, especially seeking a techno fix. And this is especially the idea that geoengineering or technology will save us from climate change. We don't have the technology to fix it now, but hey, sometime in the near future we will. Um, but this is just, I mean, a fallacy because no one can guarantee this. Um, and it's generally used for the political purpose of preventing meaningful action against the only real proven solution which is to stop emitting CO2. In chapter five, um, the authors talk about the war on climate science, how it began, they say, in the 1950s with the tobacco industry just attacking science in general by having this huge disinformation campaign saying, hey, smoking, you know, it's not that bad for you. And then um, they show how they say it continued in the, into the 1960s with a war on environmentalism. And this was led by large corporations against scientists like Rachel Carson and her book uh, Silent Spring, where she showed the negative effects of DDT and the company that man manufactured that, uh, of course, accordingly uh, protested against her work and tried to de deny her climate science. Uh, in the 1970s, 70s and the 1980s, this was a period of some climate legislation that was actually taken, and action was taken against acid rain and ozone depletion, for example. Laws were passed against uh, CFCs, for instance. And this was true in Japan as well. There was an area, era of uh, anti-pollution activism that did lead to some changes in some legislation, very important legislation. Um, so this leads Michael Mann to say that, quote, the simple fact is that environmental protection wasn't always the partisan political issue that it has become. <clears throat> but actually, to be honest, I have to strongly disagree with Michael Mann here 
his own data shows that this is not the case. Uh, protecting the environment has always been political. Uh, and uh, for instance, in Japan, just to cite some examples of the earliest uh, case of industrial pollution in modern Japan, in modern Japanese history, the Ashio copper mine, but also in the post-war, post-World War II on the, with the Minamata uh, mercury poisoning uh, case as well. And where big corporations, again, basically tried to cover this up, pay off politicians, etc., um, and fight against these uh, victims of pollution. So, I mean, this is, I think, is just clearly wrong. It's always been a political issue. <clears throat> Michael Mann then cites a free market fundamentalism as a major roadblock. This is a, a clear, a clearly a correct observation. It meshes with Naomi Klein's uh, observations of the incompatibility between capitalism and the environment. Michael Mann uh, is probably not as left-wing or progressive as Naomi Klein, I would imagine. So he never really specifically cites our uh, economic model as causing or exacerbating environmental problems. Um, but he does interestingly point out the commodification of scientific knowledge via what he calls deniers for hire, who sell, and these would be scientists, um, who are paid off basically to sell their credentials to private corporations who then use them as a mouthpiece to push their political agendas. And he gives all kinds of examples of right-wing organizations like the Cato Institute, the Heartland Institute, etc. But there's some other inconsistencies in man's argument. His basic idea seems to be that if we just had uh, access to the correct facts rather than disinformation, then we'd be okay and we wouldn't be in this mess. But He's talking about politics, and again, he's he's bringing it up, so I think we need to point this out, that this is not, unfortunately, how, how, how politics work. Politics is an inherently unequal game, uh, meaning that average people are at a disadvantage no matter how many facts they have. And this is an important point that Michael Mann does not point out, but it's, um, a, 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 it's something that, you know, he probably should have, because any discussion of politics needs to have this in there. In chapter six, uh, he looks at um, climate denial again, especially going to specific examples in the U.S. So this book is pretty U.S. focused. Um, that might limit its accessibility for readers in some parts of the world. Um, he talks about the Republican Party, especially lays a lot of blame with them and right-wing conservative politicians who are in bed with big corporations and the fossil fuel industry. And he names the names and, you know, goes into this. Uh, interestingly, Michael Crichton, from <laughs> the author of Jurassic Park, uh, he notes as a prominent climate denier as well. Um, he notes that this is pretty hypocritical, though, because while these politicians and other people are saying this, are denying climate change, I mean, the damage is already happening in their very own communities. Um, so... Why would they do this then? Well, they just want to preserve their the status quo, i.e. their own power, uh, and just want to make a quick buck, make some money. Um, but he also calls out the media as well for giving these deniers airtime and, you know, saying and, and showing that basically, I mean, they're corporate media, so their job is to make money from selling sometimes outrageous stories. In chapter seven, the authors talk about uh, geoengineering and the basic argument here, which um, Michael Mann especially lays out uh, or, or makes very convincingly, is that uh, in the case of geoengineering, the solution is, is worse than the problem it's trying to solve. Um, the most meaningful action and proven action would just be ending the use of fossil fuels. Um, but geoengineering as others like Naomi Klein have also shown, uh, is used by the rich and the powerful basically to just justify our current system of fossil fuel capitalism and um, to justify an action. So Michael Mann goes through some of the main ideas, um, um, different proposals in of geoengineering, including putting mirrors in space, shooting sulfur into the atmosphere, dumping nitrates in the ocean, etc. And then he shows very, uh, again, he argues very convincingly 
that this is not going to help. It's going to make things worse because shooting sulfur in the atmosphere, for, for example, is literally the cause of acid rain. Um, so probably not something we want to be doing or uh, living with. In chapter 8, this is the last chapter, um, he offers his path forward. And again, he shows, you know, we're burning through our carbon budget. If we want to keep the planet marginally livable, we need to be at zero emissions by 2050. And fossil fuels need to stay in the ground. So then he gives his proposals for a path forward. And I'll be honest, actually, this chapter is not so strong. I don't find his proposals to be very convincing. Uh, certainly not as convincing as his arguments uh, for the science of climate change. But he anyway argues for executive action and he praises US presidents like President Obama and some legislation he made for fuel efficient cars. He talks about grassroots action, but he doesn't really go into any examples of actual civic movements. He just talks about examples of US mayors. So I don't know, I don't think that's exactly grassroots. And then he, he says there's also a need for global action. Well, of course, obviously this all seems true, but he doesn't really talk about any, you know, what would be some global legislation um, or how would we change a global economic system. Instead, he just goes back to U.S. presidential action and, quote, leadership. Um, he praises the politics of change, and examples of this would be the 2014 People's Climate Change March, Bill McKibben's divestment campaign, and then he ends with a what can I do section where he says, well, the first step is just to leave the madhouse of disinformation and get engaged. So that's the conclusion. <clears throat> okay, now my analysis of this book, um, basically, I mean, I, I liked it. It's a, it's a pretty easy read. Um, <clears throat> it's a pretty fun read. And I think people will probably, you know, if they don't learn, if you don't learn something from it, um, <clears throat> you'll at least have a better idea of how to communicate the science of climate change much more clearly and effectively. Um, and this is really the strong point of the book. Uh, but while Michael Mann's heart is in the right place, I don't think he grasped the nature of power politics that he's talking about. Um, because as I mentioned, pow you know, politics is inherently unequal. So it doesn't matter how many facts the powerless have, because they're still powerless. What are they going to do with those facts? How are they going to challenge power structures uh, that are built in and ingrained into our unequal society? Michael Mann doesn't even address these questions. And also, he gives way too much credit to U.S. Democrats, such as President Obama, um, without identifying how they also <clears throat> uh, have um, been in bed with corporations and fossil fuel companies, and how they're milk toast solutions uh, are usually just kicking the can down the road. So I would say, uh, in my analysis, we need to couple Michael Mann's science with actual political studies of how to dismantle the fossil fuel industry and rectify uh, the inherent in inequalities of capitalism. And I just want to add an interesting aside to this uh, and talk a little bit about climate deniers in Japan. And you might be thinking, Oh no, Japan, it's a nation of reason and science. It would there's no climate deniers there. This is only a problem of the US, right? But in fact, there are and they do exist. Um, I'll just cite one example of a Twitter user, Kirie, who I have a st strong suspicion may be uh, just a bot anyway. Well, she's definitely, I don't think, a picture of this woman here. Um, if she's not a bot, then certainly a middle aged uh, man troll who spews out disinformation on climate change by cherry-picking data. Um, and, I mean, I just took a random screenshot from her Twitter. But, I mean, I don't know if this is representative or not. It seems like a lot of her stuff is just all like this, of taking data and totally cherry-picking it. So, I mean, here's data, but it's for one town in the, the U.S. state of Kansas. And she shows mean temperatures from this time period. I don't know why from this time period either. Um, but it's one small town, and she says, you know, like, oh, well, this goes against the, the idea of global warming. I mean, does it? It actually shows that it still seems like it's going up to me. Um, but this also, her comments really show how, uh, as Michael Mann said, these deniers, they peddle in skepticism. I mean, she asks, why do many media 
pretend to know nothing about that, um, even though she, by her own admission, is not a scientist. You know, so why why is she making these graphs, these pseudo scientific graphs, and then you know throwing these like kind of smart sounding questions out there? I mean, it's just to cast doubt um, uh, and and to cover up the what is obviously a lack of knowledge and facts and a disinformation campaign. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, I hope you found this useful, and if maybe, if you haven't already read the book, been inspired to give it a look, uh, but even if you don't, I hope I've gone over some of the main points and kind of covered the contents uh, to, to a certain degree. So thanks for listening, and hope to see you next time.